Today is September 25th, 2002. We are in Albany, New York. I'm with Bob Fanon. He was born in Latham in 1948, and his current address is in Cohoes, New York. Uh, that's a reverse. Born in Cohoes, New York. Current address is Latham. Latham. Okay. Um, I guess the first question is, were, we, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted. Yeah, I was one of the volunteers. Uh, I thought that uh, you know, service to my country was the right thing to do. And uh, I thought that the war effort was uh, something that I should support. And I didn't have a lot of direction in my life at that time, so I decided I would uh, volunteer. How old were you when you, uh, when you uh, volunteered? 19. 19 years old. What, uh, what war did you volunteer for? Well, it was, it was Vietnam. Vietnam. And what year did you, uh, what year did you enlist? 1967. 1967. Yeah, in 67, uh, did my uh, basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And did my advanced training, which was a combat engineer, and uh, what we affectionately called Fort Lost in the Woods, uh, Leonard Wood out in uh, Missouri. Okay. Uh, went to airborne training right, to become a paratrooper down at uh, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I went into special forces training in uh, North Pride, at Fort Pride, North Carolina, for a while. What was your first? Uh, when did you arrive in Vietnam? And what was your first job as a as, in special forces? Well, when I got to Vietnam, I had uh, loved special forces. Okay, um, I was uh, stuck in training group and a little demoralized and going through some things, and I decided I should go into the the real war. All right, so I left uh, Special Forces and went over, and I was assigned to 173rd Airborne, uh, which is up in Central Highlands in uh, Vietnam. At that time, what was the uh, what was your unit doing? What was their assignment in the Central Highlands? Of well, uh, we had varied assignments, all right, but we had a uh, an area of operation that uh, we were responsible for, and um, there was many different types of missions. Uh, we were securing certain areas. We did. Uh, uh, at some points in time, we were doing uh, road sweep operations to keep supply lines open. Uh, there were search and destroy missions out in, the, in, in the jungle itself. Um, you name it, all kinds of things. What was a what was a search and destroy mission like? Just what was well, it, was it done at night or during the day? Uh, it, most of the time, you went in in daylight, all right? and uh, you know there was suspect intelligence said there was an enemy force in the area. Right? We had to go in and try to locate the enemy force and engage them. And um, as a combat engineer, we were some of the first guys that went in frequently to, to uh, clear the landing zone and set up the base camp where we operated from. And then they would bring in the artillery and uh, we would use uh, that base camp for a period of time as long as that operation went on. And sometimes we had more permanent base camps that we operated out of rotated and went to those uh, different locations depending on the need. What was the terrain like in the Central Highlands of Vietnam? Uh, well, it was very pretty country, really. It was, uh, we were very green and very flush. Um, uh, it was extremely hot. Right? <laughs> uh, saw temperatures in the, uh, the hottest point that were 130 degrees and the humidity was 100 percent. So, you, wow. I mean, you just sweat constantly. So you had to drink water and take your halazone or take your salt tablets and whatnot all the time, along with your anti-malaria pills that uh, we got every day. Uh, and um, but the but the uh, the area was, uh, as I say, it was lovely. I saw some gorgeous. Uh, the jungle is a pretty place. I mean, there's some gorgeous flowers and uh, you know plant life. And, uh, I saw waterfalls coming out of the side of mountains that I, I still remember today. And, and uh, I saw, uh, well, every kind of creepy, creepy crawler you can imagine. Uh, uh, snakes and scorpions were everywhere. Um, that was something I learned to live with. Um, and the, uh, when we had the monsoon season, uh, that became uh, a whole other ball game where it actually, when you're in the mountains, it actually got cold. What is a monsoon like to experience? You always hear about that, but you never. Uh, it's uh, in a jungle setting in, in a wartime. It just is. Uh, it, it's kind of unbelievable, actually, because it just rained and rained and rained for days upon end, and where we never saw 
the sunshine. Uh, it would just rain. It seemed like times it was weeks. Um, there might have been some breaks in between, but uh, it, one operation that uh, I'll remember if I lived to be a hundred was uh, we were way out, and it was uh, we were up on the side of a, uh, a mountain and we were camping out up there for the night. And myself and another fellow found a couple of trees that had been knocked down by artillery fire, and we said this looked like a pretty good place. And stretched our ponchos out to try to be dry and three or four times during the night I found myself six or eight feet outside the poncho because the mud would just and you just slide down and you crawl back up and get back under there and try to catch some more rest and slid back down again so one of those uh, one of those fond memories yeah. <laughs> what was uh, life like in the in the base camp you see a lot on TV and the movies of uh, these base camps, and you mentioned you cleared areas in the jungle. What was, a lot of people say it was boring, it was exciting, you were well, it. What was the daily life like in a base if camp? If you were in a permanent, one of the more permanent base camps, that's what we considered to be really great duty because you what actually had a cot, you know, with an air mattress to sleep on, and then you had a, uh, we had what we called hooches, which had, we had built, which were, had tin roofs, and screening to keep the mosquitoes out and whatnot. That was great stuff. And hot meals and uh, that was, uh, those were good times there. You know, when you went out in, on operations and uh, you know, you went out and cleared a spot and set up a temporary base camp, uh, you, you had, you know, you might eat once or twice a day and that was, uh, you know, sea rations or what we call LERP or long range patrol rations which need a little water to, because they were dehydrated stuff. Um, and the uh, conditions were much less favorable. And uh, the, you use mosquito repellent uh, to try to keep the, the critters from eating alive. And you know you would be uh, stepping on, you know, scorpions to kill those things. And when you came across them, and we had one little uh, camp which was kind of a, a more uh, one of our more permanent base camps. And there was a stream nearby, and that's where we used to go to bathe a lot of times and to swim. Mm -hmm. And we would take turns with one guy standing on the shore with an M16 to shoot the snakes that would be coming in and out of the water to kind of keep the place clear so we what could would, enjoy it. What, what would you bring out into the field with you on a, on a, uh, on a mission? What would the American soldier, I mean, what would your unit carry with them into the field if they were going out? Depending on the nature of the mission, how long you're going to be out there, but uh, you know the obvious things of weapons and ammo was kind of kind of critical. And uh, frequently on missions, because of being an engineer, I, I'd have demolition gear with me as well, C4 explosives and whatever that we were called for. Um, and uh, you had to bring your own water enough to carry you through, and you get resupplied. You know that helicopters would come in and get you some get you some fresh water and drop some food off and, and depending on the situation if you're operating out of a out of a temporary base camp the choppers came and went and so you didn't have to carry as much and when you're more the more field type the operation was the longer and more time you're going to be out there the more you had to carry that so you might be hauling quite a bit of stuff sometimes. Did your uh, unit engage the enemy in the, in the Central Highlands? You mentioned certain oh, missions yeah. did were you, were you engaged in combat with the enemy? And Many times, all right. Uh, sometimes at their choosing and sometimes at our <laughs> choosing. All right. uh, yeah, I had a lot of uh, experience with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Even some of our more permanent camps were frequently attacked, uh, especially at night. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when we, we knew that that was the most likely time. We got daytime attacks, mm -hmm. but they were infrequent. But you knew the enemy was coming. If they were coming, it would be at nighttime. Yeah, 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 you expected it. Yeah. You never knew when they were going to come. Yeah. But the more light, it was more likely that you'd be attacked at night than in the daytime. And, uh, as a matter of, after being there for a period of time, uh, I got so, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, a lot of guys probably developed this, but I, I would hear the mortar tubes popping on the outside, and I'm, I knew that would wake me up if I was mm -hmm. asleep, and I knew we were under attack, and I'd be heading out from my position uh, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Were there, did your unit sustain a lot of casualties when they yeah. engaged the enemy? We, we had, uh, we lost a number of guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we had some, 
we had guys that, uh, that, that were killed when our camps were attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, we were ambushed a number of times, and uh, that was very difficult, and some very uh, close quarters fighting situations. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, a couple of real bad ones in January 1969, uh, where we almost got, uh, a, it was a road patrol uh, situation. We used to rotate down there every three months to uh, help out the mechanized unit. I don't remember the name of them now, but uh, mm -hmm. 401st, I think it was, or something. But um, we would go down there, and we had a chunk of supply line that was uh, what was QL19, as the highway was called. It actually was a paved two-lane highway that ran between IMK and Play Coup in the Central Highlands. And we had a stretch of that that we were responsible to make sure that uh, it stayed open mm -hmm. so supplies would flow. And the first thing every morning, a small patrol uh, with engineers and backup uh, guys, the armored infantry and the tanks, would go out and make sure that the road was open. They hadn't sure. done something, blown the road up, blown mm -hmm. a bridge up during the night, even though the bridges were mainly secure. But they used to blow up the culverts in places and take out sections of the highway. And uh, they sometimes would set up barricades uh, during the night and they frequently would be booby trapped or whatever. So uh, we used to go out, have to go out first thing in the morning in daylight and make sure that our section of the road was open. And uh, we, uh, on January 15th of 1969, uh, we went out and uh, they were dug in and waiting for us and it was a mighty bad situation. We had an awful lot of casualties real quick, dead and wounded. Mm. And uh, if they had pressed it before the reinforcements got there, they probably would have wiped us out because there wasn't that many of us left that were still in good fighting shape mm. that day. And they had knocked out several of the armored personnel carriers. And they knocked out the tank with rocket propelled grenades and mortar fire that was coming in on us. And, uh, so it was, it was a bad situation. How long did the battle take for place for? Well, it seemed like an eternity, but it probably was, uh, I, I doubt it was more than half an hour, an hour maybe, mm -hmm. but uh, it's the longest hour or half hour of one's life when you're mm -hmm. in that, that situation. So it was, uh, that was, that was pretty tough that day. And uh, as I said, we lost, lost some guys that day. Two days later on the same patrol was uh, was my turn and uh, I, I was wounded on that patrol. They came at us again and uh, that day I was not as fortunate as I was two days previously. Mm -hmm. Do you mind know saying how you were wounded or what came with Yeah, we day? were we were in the in a lead vehicle uh, which was just a, a three quarter ton truck that we operated out of because we would be looking to the sides of the road and looking out front to see what was going on. And, be looking for mines on the side of the road and whatnot because if trucks drifted over, you know, if there were mines there, then it took out the vehicle, it took out the road at the same time. So. Uh, and uh, uh, automatic weapons fire started. It was probably the, the commander of the enemy forces, and uh, rocket propelled grenades came flying out of the elephant grass. And, uh, mm. There was no place to go and no time to react. I only turned around as the firing started in time to see the streaking rocket coming in and uh, boom, that was it. And I was down and several of my buddies were down and one of them was dead instantly. Uh, one guy was blown off the back of the truck and I was sure he was dead and it turned out he didn't get a scratch. <laughs> Just a concussion knocked him off the truck and he rolled to the side of the road and uh, survived the thing. So. You see a lot that the, uh, they use the helicopters to bring the injured out. Where did, were you taken to a field hospital right away? Yeah, well, yeah, that, as, as soon as they, uh, they could get, you know, uh, get the choppers in, we got out. But, uh, yeah, the choppers were your lifeblood over there as far as getting you where you needed to go and getting you away from where you needed yeah. to get away from. Uh, except you are on a dead run sometimes, but I mean, uh, you know, when you, when you could bring them in. But the, uh, yeah, the air support was uh, was critical. On the 15th, when we had that uh, that real bad situation, we had, you know we called for help immediately when we knew we were in deep trouble. Uh, the, uh, they brought in a couple of besides reinforcements by land. They, mm -hmm. they sent some guys out from the, from our base camp that was uh, uh, 
know how many miles away it was, but they came over the road. But the uh, helicopter gunships got there, and that kind of uh, helped turn the tide pretty quickly when they brought in their firepower. What kind of firepower did those gunships have that would they, yeah, they were the Cobra gunships, which were state-of-the-art at the time, they're ancient history today. But, I mean, they had uh, uh, multiple rocket pods under each of the little wings, uh, Gatling guns and mini guns uh, that they had, and they also had a uh, uh, M79 grenade, uh, automatic grenade gun in the front, little front turret underneath, so they could, they could bring an awful lot of firepower. And, Mighty happy to see it more than one occasion. So. In, in Vietnam, if you, my understanding, if you sustained an injury, that your service would be in the rear, or you would, you if you went enlisted. No. Nah. <laughs> that's a, that's I, I don't know where you heard it, but no. it, it isn't necessarily true. No. Now, uh, in the situation, my own situation, the the, guy, the guys that were with me that survived that day, uh, we all were uh, ended up being medevac to a field hospital nearby in Ank, and that's where they did the immediate surgeries on you to make sure that, you know, you were going to not in danger of dying sure. at that point. And uh, my wounds were not so bad that mm -hmm. I was threatened, either the two guys with me were, unless we bled to death, that would have mm -hmm. been the only way, because the wounds themselves would have killed us. But, um, but they did that surgery and just spent a short time there. I think I was only there a day or something. And then uh, they uh, got us to the local airstrip and they flew us out. The Air Force flew us out on the C-130s and went to an evacuation hospital in Quignon, which was on a beautiful little town on the beach. Nice place. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there, you know, you went through the, the second surgeries and uh, if you needed them, which most mm -hmm. of us did. Uh, and you got to heal up. If your wounds were real bad, they would send you off to Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, my surgeon, I don't remember the man's name, he was a colonel, but uh, he had gotten in trouble uh, just before I got there for evacuating too many people. So uh -huh. he was taking a very conservative view of it at that time, and so I, I didn't get to go any place. Mm -hmm. I stayed right there for, um, I don't know, about five or six weeks of treatments and healing up. To, uh, Developed an infection and had to battle that for a while. And, and, not, but, uh, um, and then I ended up going, uh, getting back on a chopper and going back out to my unit and wow. doing it all over again. Wow. Is there is there any uh, situations or any humorous aspects of, of your service that kind of stick out in your mind that are, oh. are kind of something that would just stick out in your mind as being something? funny or completely out of the ordinary other than... There, the, there's all kinds of situations that you run into and, and a lot of them turn out to be humorous. Uh, um, different different things that happen. Uh, some of them are a little scary at the time and they're humorous afterwards. And, um, i trying to think of something that... Uh, um, let's see, good humorous one. One to come to mind. One night, uh, one night when we uh, when we got attacked in a base camp uh, in our per one of our permanent base camps, and uh, mortar rounds were coming in, and uh, because I had developed that sense of for survival, uh, went out to the bunker, uh, which uh, was out on the line. We had trenches and bunkers all prepared and wire on the outside, and Claymore mines and everything. We had quite a defensive position, so uh, I got into the uh, I get into the bunker, and another fellow come in, and, and uh, he stopped dead. Who's in here? And I said, Sergeant Fanta. Sergeant Fanta. How'd you get here to have a name? And I said, uh, I said, I, I said, I heard those mortars. And here I was, and, and, and he says, I didn't have time. He says, All I got is my gun and my my helmet. He was naked. <laughs> I mean, so, sleeping naked. He just and I said, "Well, you know, I don't care, and it's dark out here, and it's, it, uh, and hopefully this thing will pass fairly quickly, and uh, you know, you can go put some clothes on." So, and we had some good times. We had some good times. Yeah, good, you make good friends. And uh, how was the camaraderie? That you hear a lot about the, the soldiers. What do you, you know? The, the men you served with, the women, and the, the officers. Was there a lot of camaraderie among? 
that yeah, was the, Vietnam? The, the, there was, and um, the you, you say the women, the only women I ever saw when I was in the hospital, and there were some nurses there, and I also saw a couple times in the rear areas, I saw some Red Cross volunteers, uh -huh. and there were, other than Vietnamese women, uh -huh. uh, I mean, they were there, obviously, but uh, I didn't see too many, uh, okay. too many uh, females in uniform. Um, we had some good officers, and some of them were very close to the men. Uh, and we had some good relationships. Um, and uh, the enlisted men, a lot of them were tight. You know, uh, and, you know, the, the GIs do stupid things sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, you get rivalries. And sure. guys, if we were in the, bay, in the rear area too long, the, somebody would take a dislike to somebody, and punches would be flying. And, I mean, sure. it was a tense situation mm -hmm. sometimes. but. Uh, we partied a lot. We had a good time. We were in the rear area because the beer was there, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to uh, periodically try to figure out a way to go to the Air Force Base, which was uh, about 40 miles south or something, because that was like a that was like Disneyland there. Mm -hmm. You know, the, everything was real buildings and you know, paved streets, and mm -hmm. you know, they had a commissary and they had uh, you know real bottles of you know, good liquor there or whatnot. So, uh, Sounds good. Typical GIs that would like to like to have a good time when you could. You know. Do you remember the day you left Vietnam and, and then I guess the second part of the question is um, how you felt and how you felt when you first arrived back in the States? Yeah, I, re I remember the, uh, the day I left uh, yeah, fairly well. I'm kind of excited about going yeah. home. Uh, uh, I had um, I had been home once because I, I served for 19 months and four days. Uh, I did an extension. Uh, and I did that for multiple reasons. One is I thought that the Army back here was BS because mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of nonsense going sure. on. And at least I felt that there was a purpose there. And, um, and the guys I served with, I, I you know, had a we were all tight, and I wanted mm -hmm. to finish serving with those guys. Sure. So I came home once on leave, and uh, that happened to be the same summer that uh, Woodstock took place. And one of my civilian friends says to me, hey, you don't want to miss this. This is great. Said, you got to come to Woodstock. And I said, you don't understand. I said, I, I only have a leave that goes this time. Mm -hmm. He says, ah, stay another week or two. And, yeah, it doesn't work that way. I said, I would be in an awful lot of trouble. I said, I'm going to have to miss this big event, this big rock concert. Yeah. And as it was, um, I had to report back to McGuire Air Force Base to get back to Vietnam. And the Air Force had some difficulties with planes. And I got back to Vietnam after that leave. And they told me I was late. And I said, it's not my fault. I said, you to see my orders. I was supposed to report back. I did. Mm -hmm. I said, I can't help it that the Air Force didn't have a plane for me. And I said, well, you're going to have to stay in country two more days to make up for this two days that you were late. And I said, that seems awfully harsh. Mm -hmm. But uh, I said to the guy, I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be awfully angry. I said, if something happens in that last two days. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't. Um, mm -hmm. so. Was on, but I was on combat patrol uh, one day, and I was packing my gear and, and catching a plane to go south to Benoit the next day. And I was there for about not even 24 hours, I don't think. And then uh, we were on a plane for Japan. And uh, in Japan, didn't I run into a high school buddy who was in an Air Force uniform who was on his way over? Uh -huh. To Vietnam, which was a very chance encounter. You know, mm -hmm. Not far from home, and running into this guy at that point in time. Because yeah. they're only on the ground for maybe an hour and a half in Japan. And, uh, flew back and uh, flew into Washington, Seattle area there, and uh, got discharged. Uh, you know, it only took about a day to go through all the paperwork and mm -hmm. turn it, turn it in your gear and getting a dress uniform and making sure you had uh, everything that you needed and had to travel sure. advance for your trip home and whatever. That was it. Back what, home. <laughs> what did you do in the days or the weeks that followed? And, and 
when you, when you got back from Vietnam? Hey, like anybody, after being away for a long time, you're trying to catch up with friends and family. I also caught up on a lot of sleep. <laughs> it scared my mother real bad on that one because I, she never saw me sleep so often. I, I slept for, I don't know, I must have been close to 20 hours when I got home because I was just, I'd been totally exhausted, I'd been up for days. can throw something from the distance or something, but I said, don't, uh, don't come in and grab me or anything. I said, that would not be a good thing now. I said, it's not the right time. I'm not geared for anybody <laughs> interrupting me on uh, in, you know, that situation where it's surprising me. So. Do you still, do you maintain any relationships or contacts with any of the... Unfortunately, the uh, in the last, um, how last 10 years or so now, I've lost track of everybody. Yeah, there was a bunch that we kept in contact. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I often wonder with some of the guys uh, how they made out, because uh, some uh, drugs were not an uncommon thing. Mm -hmm. you know, we had a lot of guys that were you know, strung out on some awfully heavy stuff. And, uh, I wondered if they, when they got back, sure. you know, whether they ever got, them, just got some counseling, got themselves mm -hmm. straightened out or not. Hopefully they did. How do you think um, your service during Vietnam had, had changed uh, your life and your how you view the world now and today and what's going on in the world and, and in your own life, that experience in Vietnam? Well, I'd say that the experience in Vietnam uh, matured me a whole lot, <laughs> okay, um, uh, very quickly and I had came back with uh, you know, a sense of, uh, of the value of life and how precious it is. Uh, and um, certainly I became somebody who had, had had enough violence in a short period of time in my life that I didn't even care to see it on the silver screen or mm -hmm. uh, when I was out with friends at a bar and something afterwards when I got back. Oh, fight, fight. Everybody would empty out. To, I sat there and had my beer. I said, I don't need to see any of that. I, said, I don't care to see that. It holds no interest to me. I used to be an avid hunter mm -hmm. before, and I tried to hunt, and I went out a few times. Mm -hmm. it completely lost its appeal. Mm -hmm. I had no interest in killing anything, mm -hmm. and uh, sold my guns gave up on it and didn't care to do that anymore. Uh, and I decided that uh, you know I needed to do something to take advantage of the GI Bill. Uh, Did you went take to, advantage of the GI Bill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to, went to college and uh, went here locally, the junior college of Albany, and got a two-year degree and then I went to SUNY Albany and got a four-year degree. Uh, I did some graduate studies before my GI Bill ran out. By then I was married and had two kids and something had to go. <laughs> so education went at that point. <laughs> What's your profession now? I'm an assistant director for data processing services for New York State Department of Tax and Finance. Right. Yeah. Is there a... Which is not something I went to school for. <laughs> I have a degree in economics, but I never used that. I got into data processing, I like that, so it turned out well for me. It's, good. it's been a good career. Is there anything else that, that you wanted to talk about or you wanted to, to say before we close? Anything that, you know, your experiences are well, there, here, or? You know, the, um, yeah, a couple of things, I guess. Sure. Uh, one is that um, I, nobody could, ex until you experience what war is like, you really don't have a sense of, of, of what it, how bad it is. And, mm -hmm. I wish there was some way to be able to uh, really communicate that to, to the population as a whole to, and to our leaders before we make decisions. Uh, this is, you know, sometimes you can't avoid war and that's mm -hmm. the answer, but uh, we better think long and hard before we do it because it's a, it's a tough situation. And, uh, you know, when I think about the possibilities that they talk about Iraq now and the possibility of a war there. And, 
have it bothers me to think about that because I think about how many young men and women may be lost in that mm -hmm. conflict and how many civilians who have no political interest and that uh, don't necessarily support that regime will be killed. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that that doesn't have to happen. I'm afraid that the situation is such that it may have to happen, but uh, kind of hope and pray it doesn't. You know, the, you look back and, the, as I said, there were good times and there were bad, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and I think it's everybody's is an individual experience, and hopefully uh, a lot of people come out of it with, uh, you know, a better sense of direction in life, and uh, you know, I think it, you know, I, I adjusted well afterwards, and uh, I know that there's a lot of people that have, you know, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder mm -hmm. and never get their lives back together again. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that's an awful thing that happens. But, uh, right. Sounds good. That's good. All right. Hey, just casual conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah.